At the first glimmer of daylight. <laughs> Sunday morning and time for football, League One soccer. On the radio, Saint-Étienne stays in fourth place, two points behind Marseille, a 3-2 defeat at Sochaux and troubles for Paris. On the TV, and now football, it's the same old story between PSG and Marseille. Even if you can't stand it, and as every night, let's turn to football with PSG. You can't escape knowing who the champions are. Lens lost at home this evening to Sedan, three goals. You have to admit, there's something comforting about football. This wonderful world where there is no crisis, where money flows like water. Supporters, viewers, players. Millions sacrifice their meager revenues for the great god of football. One Lyon supporter spends an average of 600 euros a season to follow his club. So there's enormous potential for a club like Marseille with 13 million supporters. Matches, TV rights, the spin-offs, anything goes in football. Saint-Étienne's toasters, Lyon's aftershave, PSG's brushes or Bordeaux's slippers. In France alone, the turnover in soccer is 5 billion, 400 billion worldwide. But who is profiting from all of this? Come on then, bring your boots and shin guards and let's go for a stroll on the pitches of football business. You will discover how in less than 15 years the sport has become one of the most deregulated markets on the planet, where it seems anything goes. How financial exploitation of child footballers, how out of control speculation by investment funds that buy into soccer players risks ruining the sport. And how in the stadium's back offices players agents have now overshadowed even the club owners as the game's new power brokers. And how, finally, in football, those who speculate, cheat and corrupt risk destroying your favourite playing field. So, Mum and Dad, haven't you ever dreamed of your son becoming the next Zidane? Like Madin Karogli, a young French player, already a prodigy at 11 years old. His technical skills have been viewed over 20 million times on the internet. Even the great Arsene Wenger, the manager of Arsenal, is impressed. It's quite stunning what he's able to do at such a young age. He's so advanced. The amazing little talent lives in Roubaix in northern France, living and breathing football. But Madine is also a potential gold mine. Nadine, come here a second. About 60 reports in various languages have made their way onto the internet. The cameras surround him. His parents say ours will be the last as Medin is close to overdosing. What do you think about seeing yourself all over the internet? You don't like it much? What's the best thing about football? I don't know. Would you like to be left alone for a bit? <laughs> we try and be as discreet as possible. But Ian's life is hardly normal. A juggling exhibition in Dubai, a gala event in Hong Kong. Everyone wants a photo. Everyone wants a piece of him. We're philosophical about it, but it can be quite scary. He's still little after all. But yes, at some point, well, um, you know, Madin's he's 11 now, so it's time to be serious. And it is beginning to get serious for Madin. Very serious. Clubs, agents and even a well-known multinational are staking big on the 11-year-old's future. Here's the parental dilemma. How to protect their child while letting him loose in the arena. Especially when that arena is Barcelona. The famous Barca team spotted Madin early on. He's due to attend trials and then join their youth academy. FC Barcelona, one of the most successful clubs in the world, boasting such stars as Messi, Xavi and Iniesta. 
300 million supporters across the world and a turnover of almost 5 billion euros. The Karoglis gave us permission to follow young Madin. As he arrives for the test in Barcelona, it's just like a business deal. The youngster is not greeted by someone from the soccer club, but by Dubai businessman Sahmad Al Zajali. Mr. Sahmad? Mr. Mohammed, how are you? Good? All right? Yes, good, thanks. How are you? How's the champ? When he saw Madin on the internet, Al Zajali sensed a good deal. He contacted agents for Spanish footballers as well as the Corogli family. La Masia, this is the training center. It's just close by. Is this for the professionals? No, just for the kids. The family settles into a hotel. Salmad Al Zajali was the person who set up Madin's trial at Barcelona. Investing in an 11 year old child seems to pose no problems for him. Football is uh, it's a business. Football is something that uh, you invest. For example, we have uh, some real estate that we bought uh, 10, 15 years ago, and, and we still have them and uh, is an investment plan. So uh, for us, Madin is something that uh, uh, is an investment. Uh, it could be a perfect property. It could be a normal property for Madin at uh, this uh, rate that he's developing. We believe uh, 16, 17 maximum, he will be having a, you know... A, Market value. A, an interview with holding a shirt someday, for sure. <laughs> Among the 10 or so players he looks after, Medin promises to be the jackpot. According to Al Zajali, investing in the young player could be more profitable than property. As an expert in the building sector, he knows what he's talking about. The businessman made a fortune from his company, Santos Cranes, which supplied machinery to building sites. His own team consists of, in defense, the JLG 600 diesel-powered boom lifts. In midfield, there's the tough CKE 200 Caterpillar Cranes. And the star player is the QY 25C truck, equipped with a crane that can lift up to 25 tons. He likes his team sports, does Mr. Samad Al Zajali. Welcome to Barcelona. We've learned more about him than Medin's parents, apparently. Fatima, his mother, doesn't really know where to start. I wanted to ask you something. Uh, what is your business, actually? Corporate events? Sport? Management. Management. Ah, management. We know that uh, Medin, since a long time ago, we want to make it uh, from a dream to reality, you know. So, so like from dream to, to reality. The dream of Mohammed, no? You might not have noticed, but suddenly the mood changes. Mohammed, Madin's father, seems tense. Please, turn off the camera. If you show this on the TV, it will cause all sorts of speculation, and it won't be helpful. It's confidential, see? confidential and taboo, because now the Karogli family and the businessman are about to talk money. In France, such negotiations are illegal to avoid child exploitation. An agent is not allowed to make money from an underage player. A contract that deals with sports activities for minors cannot, in any circumstances, result in any remuneration or compensation. In Spain, however, there's a legal vacuum. Luckily for him, the Dubai businessman can get the Karoglis to sign on the dotted line. We managed to get a copy. Samad Al Zajali's company, Proneo Sports, offers to act as the agent for two years. In exchange for its help and its contacts, Proneo Sports will take a commission on any future professional contract. 10% if Madin signs for Barcelona or any club in Spain. 20% in all other countries. To sign up the most gifted young players, the big clubs are ready to spend up to 200,000 euros, which would come to 20,000 euros in commission for Al Zajali's company. But the first contract effectively binds the player to his agent, promising many long and profitable years ahead. Agents and kids. 
You might think football's always been like that, but it hasn't. Just ask Lillian Turan, part of France's 1998 World Cup winning team. Uh, now you're scaring me, actually. If you're telling me there are, there are 12-year-old kids who have an agent, that's a problem. Did this go on in your day? Honestly, I don't think so. I don't think so, and I think it should be banned. If there are agents for 12 or 13-year-old kids, it means there are clubs that are willing to deal with them. And say, you know, make a deal for the youngster, we like him. Such as this gentleman, Michel Zamora, the French talent scout for FC Barcelona. <laughs> he set up the trials for Medine and is one of the Dubai businessmen's contacts with the club. Okay. Al Zajali hands the torch over to him as he needs to get back to his machinery. No time to attend Medine's trials. We might be able to talk football now with Michel Zamora. You're passing the entrance. This is La Masia. That's what they call La Masia. La Masia, FC Barcelona's training center. It's a bit like the club's research laboratory. So, no filming. There are no pictures, it's banned. There are guards around and they'll spot you straight away. Time to switch to a far more discreet camera. La Masia is the world's most famous football school. Three quarters of FC Barcelona's professional squad were trained here. It's Barca's industrial secret. That's Takefusa Kobo, an eight-year-old from Japan, the youngest foreigner Barca has ever signed up. Naturally, the Spanish media has already dubbed him the Japanese Lionel Messi. Isn't eight a little young? Well, it's not too young if the player has genuine talent. Talent isn't a matter of age. It's interesting to have them when they're still little, to shape them in our image, uh, to shape them in our game, our culture, our playing culture. It's important. And as far as these kids are concerned, I'm like Father Christmas. He's very generous, this Barcelona Father Christmas. But the biggest present isn't for the kids, but for the club. By signing up 12-year-olds, it's a guaranteed way of making big money if the player later signs for another club. <laughs> How much does the club that trained them make? Ooh, uh, 130,000 for 12 to 13-year-olds? So FC Barcelona would stand to make 90,000 euros when one of its chicks decides to change clubs after one year of training. Here's how it breaks down. Let's say Madin enters Barca age 12. So if, when he's 17, he signs his first contract with another club, Barca would make 90,000 euros a year times five years, which comes to 450,000 euros. 450,000 euros compensation for Barcelona, a good amount. Very good, actually. So the younger you take on the player, the more money you make in any transfer. Exactly. So that's why age is so important. It's all a factor now, then. Oh, yes, of course. It's an important money maker for the club, sure. But wait, there's more. The clubs, by picking their recruits so young, stand to gain for another reason. During a professional's long career, the club that trained them makes up to 5% on each subsequent transfer. Take the former Barca player Thiago Motta, a defensive midfielder. Since leaving the club in 2007, he's played for Atletico Madrid, for Genoa and Inter Milan, before moving to Paris Saint-Germain. Every time he changed clubs, Barcelona got their share, totaling more than 710,000 euros. It's one of the secrets of the professional clubs, their Ali Baba's cave, by taking on a player as young as possible, it assures a comfortable income throughout his entire career. Such are the financial stakes that weigh heavily on the 11-year-old shoulders of Madin and on his agent and the club. 
Madin. Madin, training time. He's a forward, isn't he? Yeah. The pressure increases as, in just a few minutes, the boy faces the trials to become a team member. The serious stuff starts here. Madin is nervous. If he fails, it's adios, Barcelona. <laughs> Despite his dad's encouragements, the youngster seems overwhelmed by the occasion and fails to match his usual standards. After the training session and for scout Michel Zamora, Medin's anxiety poses a problem. The trainer says he needs to relax. He told me he was trembling in the changing room. Before signing him, Barcelona wants to give Madin another trial, a year later. In the meanwhile, his parents will do what they can to protect him from the financial pressure and from the media attention. With a Dubai investor, a sponsor and the clubs that want him, is Madin at 11 an exception? In France, players with his skills might end up here, at the National Training Institute at Clairefontaine, near Paris. It's the most prestigious soccer school in the country. All the greats have attended. Thierry Henry, Nicolas Anelka, Blaise Matouidi, William Gallus. Today, the hopefuls for entry selection are being put through their paces. We wanted to see if here too, the business of football is making an impact. Bonjour. But at the entrance, France too. No, uh, you have no permission to film according to the Federation's press office. Uh, nope. Uh, pull up over there, please. I'll, I'll show you. It's Martin uh, Boudou, right? That's me. There you see, the, uh, the press officer says no journalists or cameramen uh, to report about what's happening. Uh, no access for any of you. Oh well, that's what happens if you work for cash. We'll never be granted access to film inside the Institute. And we'll tell you why. Using our secret camera helps explain the story of the 1,012-year-old players hoping to be chosen for the 25 available places. The training program here lasts for two years, after which the players will sign for professional clubs. Around the pitch, fathers, mothers and the recruiters for the big clubs are allowed to be here, and so, in fact, are all the top people in the business, notably the players' agents. Let's listen in. Well, both of them are useless. Uh, when he comes out, he says nothing. He's got no vision. The number seven, though, well, you know, the guys will work him hard. You'll see. Uh, I bet his family, they're, they're not dwarves. Yeah, he's, uh, he's not bad. Real poets. But there's a slight problem. Remember the French law that forbids agents from signing up an underage player, or even through his parents, for money? Well, that's why the Institute doesn't give agents the right to attend the selection process. Were you able to get in? Martin. Nearby, two Italian agents are also negotiating. If you want a good quality. If you want good quality, you have to buy them now? And a little further on, here's a con artist. He has no license from the French Football Federation to be an agent. It's as if your doctor had no qualifications. Are there any kids that you're already following? Yeah, there's one kid I'm keeping an eye on. Which one? As cool as you please, without a license, the fake agent could end up in prison. He wouldn't be the first, including one man who was sentenced for child trafficking. Is this a good age to sign them up, or should they be younger? Oh, I look for them at this age. Uh, I need to get in before the recruiters arrive. Why? Well, if you're late, the kid will tell you, I've already signed with a club, I don't need you. So you need to be the first to be useful then. Exactly. The picture may be getting clearer. In order to be helpful and run a successful business, the agent needs to make his move very quickly. He'll make his money later, when he gets the youngster to sign professional forms with a club. Clairefontaine is the ideal place to do business. 
On the left, a scout for a club. On the right, another unlicensed agent. I have one player who's at Mont Rouge. Uh, the one that was here this morning? Yes, uh, I think he's the best of the lot. Yes, he's interesting. The scout leaves his business card with a fake agent. The scouts from the big clubs try to spot the obvious talent early to sign them up when they graduate from the training institute. One of them explains the tricks of the trade to get the parents on board. They give us a lump sum, which officially is for expenses. But between you and me, it's a cover. When you say it's a cover, does that mean you still need to account for it? Oh, the money is meant for school fees. If the kid is 13 and spends two years at Clairefontaine, the money goes to his parents. Uh, it costs 7,000 euros to send a kid to this uh, institute. And the fee goes up after 15, presumably? Or oh, as much as 50,000 euros when a 15-year-old signs up. According to our sources, then the amount could rise to 200,000 euros. Let us leave the wonderful world of children and step into that of adults. The constant desire for players and the lack of effective controls ends in footballers becoming a financial investment scheme. When you pay for your entry fee or season ticket to a club, you may well be financing an obscure investment fund that has financial interests in players in rival teams which could lead at worst to match fixing and at best to financing agents who are not against taking legal shortcuts. From up in the terraces, do you know who your cl season, Mangala played with Standard Liège in Belgium. He consistently played well. What a goal! Magnificent! It's Mangala! In the summer of 2011, Standard Liège senses there's money to be made and decides to sell its young star. The, the players, uh, Stevan Defour, Eliakim Mangala, are about to sign with FC Porto once they've passed tomorrow's medical examinations. Vont passer demain. The doctors carefully inspect Eliakim Mangala and give the all clear. The Portuguese club purchases the defender for 6.5 million euros, announcing that if they ever sell him, it would be for at least 50 million euros, eight times as much. Good added value for Porto. The Portuguese club, a listed company, is competing in the Champions League, the most important and lucrative of all European tournaments. But on the 6th of December 2011, despite this magnificent goal, FC Porto is knocked out in the group stages. Farewell to extra income from ticket sales. Goodbye to the 22 million euros prize money for the tournament winner. The following day, the value of FC Porto's stock tumbles. The club needs an urgent injection of cash. And three weeks later, the club announces it will sell a one-third share of Eliakim Mangala for 2,647,059 euros. Oof. The share value recovers all its lost ground and investors are relieved. The new owner of 33.33% of Eliakim Mangala is the Duayen Group, which specializes in the extraction of uranium, coal, and gold. One third of the career of the young footballer is now in the hands of the mining group. Did you know players can belong to investment funds? Football's come a long way. We don't have the means to buy part of any player for future teams at cash investigation, but we could just about afford this cardboard silhouette, which costs 35 euros. 
does the player know who he belongs to? After all, it is his body, his head, and his legs. It's worth a trip to Porto to ask him. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed at Porto Airport. And in Porto, the player has agreed to an interview. How are you? Uh, should we sit over there? 15 minutes with his sponsor's ads as background and under the watchful eye of FC Porto's communications officer. We show Eliakim Mangala his cardboard effigy. Not bad. Listen, we found out that FC Porto has sold part of your financial rights to an investment fund called Doyen that specializes in uranium, coal and gold mining. I wanted to ask if you were aware of that or, or not. No, I, I didn't know about that. But I saw it in the media later. But you didn't sign anything? No, I, I just saw it one morning on, on the internet. I read what had happened, but I hadn't been told about it beforehand or anything like that. Do you feel sometimes like a financial product which people can speculate on? Well, yeah, we are financial products every day. Uh, the clubs are like factories and the players are the product. Yeah, I mean, there's no question about it. We are products, which you can, people can speculate on. Yeah, of course, you need to be realistic. We wanted to find out a little more about the Doyen Group. On its website, the investment fund profiles the 23 players it owns. Among them, there's Eliakim Mangala and another French international, Jeffrey Condogbia. All are promising young players. Doyen has invested an average of 10.5 million euros in each of them. Yet one question remains. How much profit is there in investing in a footballer? We tried getting hold of Doyen management for months. Impossible. But one day we went along to their operational HQ in London. It's a splendid building in the heart of the capital's financial quarter. By coincidence, one of the managers we had been in touch with was just coming back from his lunch break. Hi, Mr. Yes. yes, Martin Mudo. I'm a French reporter. Nice to meet you. We uh, we were we talked on the phone. Yes. A few days ago, you remember? Okay. Uh, we were we were here to uh, ask for an interview with someone from Doyen. No. Can I can I ask you a question? Like real quick. It's just I just want to know if 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 Doyen Capital why, why Doyen Capital invest in football? That's the only thing, sir. It doesn't it's, matter. Doesn't matter. It's, that's a simple that. question. Is it more profitable than uranium? You can't. You have, to make, you have to make up on So I've got to ask you to leave the premises. Thank you. Yes, our questions to Doyen's management are a little radioactive. The new fashion of investment funds snapping up players is very controversial. After all, footballers are not racing horses. They are human beings, just like you and me. And in theory, no human can belong to an investment fund. And besides, it's strictly forbidden in France and Britain. But not in the rest of Europe. Not very ethical, is it? True, but it is profitable. Forget about your typical bank's interest rates. Invest instead in Deco, the Portuguese midfielder who has provided a 21% profit for his investor. Lissandra Lopez, before signing for Lyon and then Qatar, generated a 37% return on investment for a Gibraltar-based fund. Argentinian player Angel Di Maria, 64%. But even that is nothing compared to Pepe, the Real Madrid defender, a 147% return. And finally Falcao, the former Atletico Madrid player, now in Monaco's ranks, a 164% return on investment for his Dutch-based fund. So by now, if you supporters go to a match, say, between FC Porto and FC Seville, you will know who is really making money from you. Go ahead, place your bets. The Duane group that's playing a game behind on the Soccer Investment Fund, which is wagering a game on Soccer International. 
The Brazilian investment fund. Nice pass by Carneiro, the international winger of the Duane group. Soccer investment opens it up to goal football. The Luxembourg fund. It's a shot, but unfortunately it's blocked. It would be funny if it were just a video game. But the reality is the investment funds are accused of influencing clubs' decisions. More worrying is that they own players in teams that are likely to play each other. As in the case of the game between Porto and Seville, where the Dwayne group has interests in both camps and the temptation to cheat must be strong. What if the funds preferred the red team to win? And where's the referee in all of this? Above the national federations, there's UEFA, which controls European football. In 2007, Michel Platini, the president of UEFA, stated in the media that investment funds owning players was at an end. Six years later, no change. Did Platini, the referee, swallow his whistle? We visit UEFA headquarters near Geneva in Switzerland. We finally get an interview with Platini after trying for three months. Here's what his director of communications had to say. I've seen uh, the president today and unfortunately he no longer wishes to take part in your program. Why? He just doesn't want to do it. That's a shame as we really wanted to ask him a few questions. But there is a press conference on the Euro 2020 tournament and we slip in with all the sports reporters. Martin Boudot. Martin Boudot, France 2. France 2. France 2? That's surprising. You've been the head of wafer for six years and you've always said you don't want investment funds mixed up with the game. Uh, why, is, why are they still doing it then? Because no one ever listens to me. No one listens to you? You're the boss of wafer and no one pays any attention? Nobody. Let me mention Eliakim Mangala, the young French international who's now at FC Porto. 30% of his rights belong to an investment fund whose main business is coal and uranium. Do you think that's normal? Listen, if I thought it was normal, I wouldn't be fighting to change things. FC Porto is a member of UEFA. They play in the Champions League. Listen, we're, we're fully aware of all the problems. We know that often in matches, these people often own players in several teams and that they'd let them out. Uh, it's like leasing, really, like airplanes that can be rented from the leasing companies. It's a black mark. Now I know why you're here. And you know what? There are even more surprising aspects to companies owning players. Sometimes the investment funds allow agents who have been banned to be paid. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed at Porto Airport. Let's go back to Eliakim Mangala at FC Porto. You recall this document by which Porto sold on one third of the player's value to the Duayen Group? Well, the same document also shows another 10%, 650,000 euros, has been granted, at no cost, to Roby Plus, another company. Does the player know about that deal? We also know that Porto has sold 10% of your transfer rights to a company called Roby Plus. Uh, does that name ring a bell? Have you ever heard of that company? Have you heard of it? No, no, not at all. May I interrupt for a minute? Put. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, the interview is all, all around the, his transfer. No, 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 uh, what's, what, what, what's, what I happened. understand your point of view, but that's not FC Porto's point of view. Well, why is it so? Because it's business. That's the secret, mm. okay? That's FC Porto's secret. Okay, Mangala. Okay, Mangala. It's the managers who talk about transfers, not you, okay? No, it's not. It's not. So we're going to move on to some other subject, okay? So we can't talk about this kind of thing? Finished? Finished. 
The great thing is that no one knows who is behind Roby Plus. At Porto, at any rate, it's impossible to find out anything else. We have documents, however, that indicate a certain Maurizio Del Menico is the director of Roby Plus. There are no pictures of the man, yet he appears well known in most of the world's company registers, especially in the tax havens. In Liechtenstein, Del Menico is a director of at least two companies. In Ireland, it's seven, in Britain, 14. And in Panama, he seems to be involved in 40 companies. And finally, in Switzerland, Maurizio Del Menico shows up on the board of 335 companies. In all, the businessman is connected to almost 400 companies around the world. We spent months trying to track him down, without luck. Until, one day, a voice at the other end of the phone. Oui, Monsieur Delmenico. Yes, Mr. Delmenico. Oui. Yes. The company called Roby Plus, of which you're a director? Yes. I want to know why this company was involved in the FC Porto transfer. Yes, because I work... Um, I work with other partners. They, they know about the players and... They deal with that, and I draw up the contract. What partners are you talking about? Luciano D'Onofrio. I, I work with him. So, Mr. D'Onofrio and you handle the transfer of Mangala? Yes, yes. So, you and Mr. D'Onofrio own Roby Plus? Yes, we do business together. Here's the thing, D'Onofrio has been sentenced many times by the French courts. The last occasion was in 2008. In the case of Marseille Football Club's accounts, he received two years with six months to be served behind bars. To help the transfer of one of his players, Luciano D'Onofrio is suspected of having given then Marseille manager Roland Courbis backhanders. football's governing body, FIFA, is unequivocal. You need to be squeaky clean to be a football agent with a criminal record untarnished by either financial or violent crime. According to this regulation, Luciano D'Onofrio no longer then has the right to be a player's agent. So here is how it seems to have broken down. Mr. D'Onofrio allegedly set up Elia Kim's Mangala's transfer to FC Porto. But since he was barred from acting as an agent, he couldn't receive any sort of commission. But the solution he found was to negotiate 10% of the financial rights of the player with the club, some 650,000 euros. One slice in the Mangala cake, which he successfully camouflaged through a letterbox company in England. That's also what football is about. You can well imagine we have a few questions for Luciano D'Onofrio. He turned down all our interview requests. Our last resort was to stand outside his house in Liège in Belgium. Almost on cue, when we place our cardboard cutout of Mangala, D'Onofrio leaves his house. Bonjour, monsieur. Hello, France 2. Hello, sir. We just want to ask you one question, sir. About the transfer of Mangala. We're just looking for some answers, Mr. D'Onofrio. About Mangala's transfer. Please wait. Wait for me. The former football agent seems in great shape. We didn't expect that reaction. It left us breathless. Mr. D'Onofrio explains all on the telephone. I don't want to give an interview, so please leave me alone. All right, do you have any links with the Roby Plus company? No, no, do whatever you're meant to, but just leave me in peace. Now, let's see that again in slow motion. 
because a few days later, Mr. D'Onofrio's lawyer contacted us to say it actually wasn't Mr. D'Onofrio we were chasing, but a lookalike hired by his boss to deceive us. In Europe, we detected about 100 top-class players owned at least in part by investment funds. And throughout the world, there are about 1,000. The football agents are everywhere and have seized power. But occasionally clubs do without their services. Without them, transfer deals ought to be far more transparent. In theory. But at Valenciennes, one of the club's players is reportedly at the center of a strange tax scam. Hello, it's France 2 TV. Amazing, here they open up for us. Welcome to Valenciennes' ultra-modern training center. Uh, can you park over there, please? Oh, okay. Oh, this must be the players parking, eh? This is the journalist's parking space. Valenciennes is one of the historic teams in France's championship. 11th in the league last year. The club is in some financial difficulties and a long way from being able to compete with financial heavyweights PSG and Monaco. In their squad is midfielder Carlos Sanchez, a Colombian international, adored by the fans. If I mention the name Carlos Sanchez, oh, a great player. Actually, I think we can't do without him at Valenciennes at the moment. I was very surprised he might leave for a Chilean club. I hope he still likes it here. He might stay on a bit more. Yes, what happened to Carlos Sanchez last summer is quite interesting. His contract was up with Valenciennes, and despite being wanted by some of Europe's top clubs, he eventually signs up here in Talca, in Chile. Talca has a theater and a great view of the Andes. And of course, a stadium, home to the famous Talca Rangers, who were 10th in Chile's national championships. Odd choice, really, for a player from a major European league. Yet almost as soon as he arrived in Talca in August 2012, he turned around and headed back to Valenciennes, where he played for another season. Quite an about face, especially since Sanchez had agreed to a substantial pay cut. This confidential document reveals he had been earning 75,000 euros gross a month at Valenciennes before he left. On his return, his salary fell to 14,700 euros a month, a drop of some 80%. This is a Colombian soccer player, not the so-called Polish plumber. Why, we want to know, did he accept such a cut in salary? And did he ever really set foot in Chile? We showed him some photographs of Talca. Can I show you three photos? It's like a game, and you tell me if you recognize where it is. What about this? Does this mean anything to you? No. No. What about this team here? Do you know which team this is? It's the photo of the Talca Rangers. No. Did you really go there or not? Yes, I went, but I, I didn't see any of the setup. All the players. But you returned at a discount. Your wages were cut. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Because, but you, from 75,000 to 14,500? Yes. That's enormous. Is it because you're a nice guy and you love the club? Yes, I do like the club. It's what made up my mind about coming back. Uh, last question, if I can. Sorry, we, uh, we need to go, they're telling me. Uh, but, uh, no, especially since the topic is not what we agreed on. This is bad. The communication department of Valenciennes is uneasy because, in fact, it's all a scam to try and substantially reduce the club's social charges paid on Sanchez's salary. And here's how we know. To start with, the date in the contract for the loan of the player by the Talca Rangers back to Valenciennes is given as the 21st of August, 2012. It is signed at Valenciennes by Sanchez in person, even though he was meant to have been in Chile at the time and wasn't due back in France for another nine days. In other words, the entire loan operation was organized from Valenciennes, and Sanchez never set foot in Talca. In addition, the Chilean club does not exactly have a good reputation in South America. Last summer, after months of inquiry, the Argentinian tax authorities published a list of 10 clubs in the world. They're suspected of helping European clubs defraud the taxman. On the list, 
are the Talca Rangers. It's the same merry dance. To pay less social charges on a player's salary, a big club has Talca Rangers sign him up and then loan him straight back again. It's an arrangement that seems to suit everyone. In this case, Valenciennes paid out 400,000 euros to Rangers. Some will be paid to Sanchez, a salary. Valenciennes can then pay just a small part of his wages in France and save a huge amount in social security contributions. Given the topic, Jean-Raymond Legrand, the president of the Northern Club, isn't too welcoming. Uh, who are you exactly? France 2, exactly. Stadium 2? No, no. Um, we're interested in the case of Carlos Sanchez and also Valenciennes. And we'd like to ask you two or three questions. On what? Do you have five minutes? Uh, can we sit down? Well, it depends on the questions. I'll answer what I want to answer. He agreed, uh, we understand, to a cutback. Well, listen, that's a secret between the club and himself. Well, more specifically, he earned 75,000 euros gross monthly in 2011. I don't know, it's you saying it. I didn't say it. If you have the figures you claim, that's fine. He earned 75,000 a month gross in the 2011-12 season. Uh, these are, listen, these are highly confidential documents. I think we'll stop there because you shouldn't have those. If the league gave them to you, listen, I'm not going to start calling up the league to... No, it's my job, that's how I got them. No, wait, these are confidential documents that nobody at the club should have or could have, but you, you have the documents. Today we can talk sports, I can talk to you about any sport, I can tell you about the club, I can tell you everything, but if you're doing an inquiry into one of my players, you can do that without me. We're just trying to understand. Listen, I don't get upset. You have documents from the league you should not have. So someone in the league has not done what he should have. And as the director of the league at the next meeting, I'm going to bring this up with the president. So can you tell me about these documents? Listen, you're telling me there is a document or such a document and it's my problem. You know these documents. It's my job to track them down. Let's not lie about it. It's finished. It's finished. Did, uh, we're going to stop right there. Did you arrange the loan with Ra Rangers Talca? Listen, I organized nothing. Mine is a clean club, calm, no problems. I didn't organize anything. Can we sit down? so we can talk about it? I said, I'm stopping, so I'm stopping. That's it. That is not why I came today. I'm not here to investigate a player. But Mr. Legrand, thank you for coming. I know what I've done. Thank you, madam. See you again. Mr. Legrand, we're just trying to get the story straight. By our calculations, Valenciennes saved up to 41% in social contributions on Carlos Sanchez's salary. The club never did answer our questions. But one highly placed French Football Federation officer does agree to be interviewed on condition of anonymity, and he confirms our theories. There are a lot of flashing lights and warnings, the salary, the total amount, the date, the fact it's a former player. And everyone knows about that Chilean club. I mean, the scam is odd, actually. It's, it's quite pathetic, really. They're saving on their social security contributions. Everything's fine from Valenciennes' point of view, and, and this, but the second kiss-cool effect, if you will, is that it lowers their wage bill. It's happening more and more, especially during the economic crisis. We never saw this before. It's something that could become more common when clubs get into trouble. They'll try anything. Football as business is all about financial one-upmanship. Clubs like Valenciennes have trouble keeping up. With six minutes of normal time remaining, we've kept the best for last. Our investigations have shown that football is like the jungle. Laws that are flaunted, a lack of controls, conflicts of interest. Going over and over the issues, the question always boils down to why are there so many professionals in the sport that find it so hard to play by the rules? Maybe because, as so often, the bad example starts at the very top from the International Football Federation. It's not a pretty story. Sepp Blatter has been in charge of FIFA for 10 years, during which time the association has been racked by corruption scandals. Sepp Blatter, the king of football. One of the most serious allegations is that FIFA officials took bribes. And they don't seem too worried about it. Bribes from the ISL, the company that at the beginning of the early 2000s managed the TV rights for the World Cup. Swiss justice authorities compiled a full report. Here are the bank transfers from ISL to FIFA officials. One received a total of 10.5 million euros spread over several transfers. 
Here is another 1.5 million Swiss francs, about 1.2 million euros for the former FIFA president, Zhao Havelange. At the time, though, there was a legal void in Switzerland. So Joao Havelange, FIFA and some other managers signed off on a check to the Swiss authorities to stop their inquiries. With such a scandal brewing, you'd have thought Havelange and his cronies would have been promptly shown the door. Not a bit of it. Why? Let's pose that question to FIFA's current number two, Jerome Valk. I find it hard to talk about the ISL file, as it's not an issue I was involved in at all. I came to FIFA in 2003. Yes, OK, but you're the number two at FIFA, and this is a matter which can be very embarrassing. After all, who is your honorary president? Jao Avalanche. Jao Avalanche. Here is a gentleman who received bribes, a gentleman who has received 1.24 million euros and who is now your honorary president, so it does concern you. Yes, he is my president of honor. Uh, he was appointed honorary president by the FIFA Congress. I don't have any direct dealings with Joao Havelange. But what does that mean to you, the word honorary? It means exactly what it says in the dictionary, that you're unrespect... Uh, what's the word? Uh, that you're respectable. Hang on, you tripped over a word there. Irreproachable, I mean. Irreproachable. You almost said unrespectable. We know the honorary president is involved in a case of corruption. Congress has the power to ask the honorary president to renounce his title if a case harms FIFA's reputation. Is that what you'd like to see happen? I have nothing to say about it. Uh, I just know that a report will be given to the FIFA Congress and the Congress will make whatever decision they wish. So you're saying the executive committee makes all the decisions? All the policies, yes. The executive committee of FIFA. They're 23? They're 25. There are 25. Now there's also a Nicolas Sleos. Nicolas Sleos, yes, he's the president of Connibal. But he He's also received bribes worth 590,000 uh, euros from ISL, and he is part of the 23 who will have to decide on all ethical issues in football. It's a bit like being both the judge and the jury, and he's been tainted by the same case. Listen, as I said, the ISL dossier was submitted to the Ethics Committee of FIFA. The Ethics Commission, uh, they will let us know what sanctions they are taking against which people and decide who has acted wrongly or against the interests of FIFA. Listen, we went through each line of the documents we obtained that were prepared by Swiss Justice, and they say very clearly that there was no way Sepp Blatter, who is now your boss and head of FIFA, there is no way that he could not have known what was going on. And, well, and uh, you'd think the boss of FIFA was aware of the bribery and corruption, yet he said nothing, did nothing. Well, you'll have to ask him about that, not me. But no, you're the number two, though. Can't you answer for him? I can't answer for him. You're not being very supportive. <laughs> on the contrary, I'm being very supportive. It would be wrong to answer on his behalf. He knew that's what's being said. It was written there. OK, well, ask him the question, not me. Of course, we would have loved to interview FIFA's number one, Sepp Blatter. But once again, the door remained closed to us. But two weeks after our interview, Nicolas Sleos resigned from FIFA. And a week after that, Jao Havelange also resigned from his position as honorary president. Those who love football know that when Brazil coughs, football catches a cold, a bad one. And now Brazil is screaming, protesting the enormous costs of organizing the 2014 World Cup. In Italy, another hallowed ground of the soccer god, the police has searched through the records of 41 clubs they suspect of financial fraud. And in France, the attendance figures continue to fall. 50,000 spectators less than five or six years ago. Are these then the first signs of a crack in the hitherto flourishing business of football?